Hello, everyone. My name is Phil McCauley. I'm a second year Master's of Public Administration and Policy student. Hello, my name is Paula Buchanan. I have a Master's in Business Administration and a Master's of Public Health and Health Policy and Management. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nicola Tornis. I'm a first year candidate for my Master of Public Health. Good afternoon. My name is Brianna Roberts. I'm a first year Public Administration student. My team and I are so excited to be with you today and to tell you about our policy solution, FEM. I'd like to introduce you to Emily. Emily is a homeless woman living in Athens, Georgia. Every day, Emily struggles to find food and water, clothing and shelter, all of the things that we take for granted. One day, Emily, Emily lives in one of the tent cities a makeshift shelter because she cannot afford permanent housing and the shelters are full. One day, Emily wakes up to realize that she started her period. The problem is, is that Emily has no feminine hygiene products on hand and she needs the cash that she has to buy food. Emily knows that she'll need three pads or tampons per day and that her period typically lasts five days. This means that this month and every month, Emily will need 15 pads or tampons. Emily visits the crowded Homeless Service Day Center, and although she's embarrassed, she asks if they have any feminine hygiene products. The staff tells her that they're sorry, but that they're out. Emily leaves, frustrated and ashamed. So what will Emily do? Emily will use whatever she has on hand, be it an old t-shirt, dirty socks, bundled up newspaper, or even nothing at all. Without feminine hygiene products, women experience extreme and unnecessary physical, mental, and logistical setbacks. I'm going to start with the physical health. Using items that are not designed for menstruation can lessen a woman's ability to fight infection. And if she's not able to change her tampon regularly because she doesn't have enough, she can experience toxic shock syndrome, a rare but life-threatening disease. Now I'll talk about the mental health implications. Without basic necessities for feminine hygiene, women feel helpless, ashamed, and vulnerable. In fact, Women experiencing homelessness are seven times more likely to experience a major depressive episode in their lifetime than members of the general population. And last, let's talk about the, the practical implications of not having feminine hygiene products. Basic cultural norms of cleanliness and hygiene are critical components to being employable. During menstruation, a woman's clothes are likely to become soiled, and this is an absolute certainty if she does not have access to feminine hygiene products. The vast majority of homeless individuals are seeking employment, but in order to be able to get a job and keep it, they must meet professional expectations of cleanliness. This problem is happening in communities across the nation. In our state of Georgia, there are over 17,000 homeless individuals, but only 10,000 beds in emergency and transitional shelters. This means that almost half of the homeless population in our state is not receiving the, the resources they need, including feminine hygiene products. In the United States, there are over 600,000 homeless individuals. Organizations exist to meet the needs of this population, but like those in Georgia, they're constantly struggling to keep up with demand. Our research showed that one of the most common unmet needs for women experiencing homelessness is a lack of pads and tampons. Homelessness is an issue in every community and not one that can be easily addressed, but we can mitigate some of the suffering for women such as Emily. This problem is not about convenience. It is about public health. And up until now, this has been a silent problem. FEM is breaking the silence. FEM's mission is twofold. First, to provide feminine products and hygiene education directly to the women who need it. And second, to provide education and advocacy to emphasize the importance of proper feminine hygiene and to reduce the taboo that surrounds menstruation in our society. Each FEM kit contains pads, tampons, or both, 
as well as panty liners, sanitary wipes, Midol, hand sanitizer, and a targeted health message. Pads and tampons will come in a variety of sizes to meet the everyday needs of women. As one of the long-term goals of FEM is to increase feelings of normalcy within the female homeless population, we believe it's important to give them the choice among three kits, pads only, tampons only, or a combination of both. To reduce feelings of uncleanliness that often accompany menstruation, we will be including sanitary wipes in our kits. These can be quickly and easily used by homeless women to increase hygiene. Menstruation is often accompanied by painful cramps, and many women use a medication called Midol to relieve this pain. Midol is specifically designed to relieve menstrual cramps and marketed directly to women. For these reasons, we have decided to include Midol and not Advil or a generic equivalent in our kits. To reduce the chances of infection, it's imperative that a woman have clean hands when positioning a sanitary napkin or inserting her tampon. Unfortunately, many homeless women don't have regular access to facilities to clean their hands, and so we've included hand, san excuse me, hand sanitizer in our kits as well. FEM will also work alongside community partners, such as the Athens Nurses Clinic and Project SAFE, to develop accurate and meaningful health messages that will be directed toward the target population of homeless women. These messages will be printed on a trifold business card that will also include contact information for FEM and other community resources, as well as the date and time for the next month's pickup event. There are two prongs to our distribution. The first is a direct approach, and the second is through an, an infrastructural organizational network. Oh, I'm sorry. So first we're gonna work to serve those 50% of women who are currently not using the existing infrastructure in Athens. We're gonna do this by directly distributing the kits to women who are living in those 10 cities. The second part of the distribution network is through the Athens Coalition for the Homeless, an umbrella organization that oversees the over 30 organizations existing in Athens to serve this community. We have partnered with these organizations and will give them kits that they can then distribute to their clients. In addition to serving the feminine hygiene needs of the homeless women, FEM kits will serve as a tangible tool to further FEM's mission. But the provision of these FEM kits alone is not enough. One of the most important aspects of FEM's mission is to increase awareness of this issue through education and advocacy. We'll work with our community partners to engage community members in conversations and to open a dialogue around these issues so that we can reduce that taboo and increase awareness in our community around this incredibly important but often ignored issue. There are three phases to FEM's plan. The first is project development, which occurs from January to May of 2015. In this phase, we've established those community partnerships that we talked about, and we'll continue to obtain data to determine the exact unmet need in those organizations. We've also attended coalition meetings to further FEM's mission. The second phase is the beta phase, which occurs from August to June of 2015. At this point, we'll roll out the program to the Athens Nurses Clinic to serve those women that are visiting that clinic. We'll also I'm sorry, we'll conduct one-on-one -on -one interviews with agency leaders to gauge their opinions on the effectiveness of our program, as well as conducting focus groups and surveys directly with those homeless women so we can find out their opinions on the efficacy of our kits. We'll continue to streamline our plan before rolling it out to a larger client base. That'll occur in our implementation phase, which occurs from September 2015 and beyond. At this point, we'll roll out the program to the remainder of Athens-Clark County, as well as beginning to hold our distribution events and going directly to those tent cities to distribute the products to the women who aren't being served at those organizations. As we gain momentum, we hope to spread through the remainder of Georgia as well. Fem kits cost an average of $3.29 per client per month with an additional 85 cents in promotional costs. That means for the first year of operation, we can serve athens Clark County for $5,743. In year one, we'll work to serve the entire female homeless population in athens Clark County. That's about 100 women. We'll continue to seek funding and new partnerships so that by year three, we can expand to Gwinnett County and serve 565 clients. By year four, we hope to expand to the entire Atlanta MSA and serve just under 5,000 clients. 
FEM has the plans in place to make implementation possible. FEM is an innovative, turnkey solution that can help women in any community with any poverty level across the entire nation. Now let's get back to Emily. In September, when FEM has been implemented, Emily won't be turned away by those shelters. She will have a reliable source of feminine hygiene products to use every month. Because of FEM, there is no longer a reason why Emily or any other homeless woman should go without the feminine hygiene products she needs. FEM is about respect, period. Thank you all so much for your time. At this point, we'd love to open it up to questions. And as you're thinking about what you'd like to ask us, Philip and Paula are going to pass out some samples of our FEM kits so you can take a look at what exactly we'll be giving to these women. Feel free to open them up. We'd love for you to take out our health message and see what we'll be distributing. Thanks so much. So as you're promoting certain products in here, have you thought about consulting those companies for funding? Absolutely. So corporate partnerships take a little more time to establish. Um, so at this point, we don't have those established, but we are in the process of working towards working with those corporations to uh, receive donations or discounts for bulk products. You, um, again, the kits are amazingly cheap per per person per month, um, and your budget uh, looks pretty good, except that I just don't see where you have any anything allocated toward um, people to put the kits together, or, uh, people to go out and begin the process of developing the relationships with the corporate sponsors. How do you sustain this beyond this particular group? So our scale if for Athens, we believe that we can accomplish it with a small group of volunteers in our first year. However, in years three and four, as we expand out of Athens into the rest of Georgia, we will be hiring a full-time employee to be a director and development um, associate. And, and you know of, of any other programs like this nationally? We're so glad you asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> because the answer is no. We've looked extensively and we haven't found any programs like FEM throughout the nation. There's a number of, um, of groups that work in, on an international basis, but FEM is really innovative um, in that there are no other existing organizations doing exactly what we do. You are <clears throat> to be commended for raising awareness about a problem that I know from the experience of your presentation yesterday among our small group, no one had thought about this as an issue, so you, you, you certainly are raising awareness of it. But in terms of your long-term goal, you, where you allude to uh, an advocacy component, uh, and you say that um, in the long term, we aim to prevent the issue from occurring in the first place, I, I don't see much indication of that. In other words, your comfort zone is to be a service provider because you're going to expand into the Atlanta metropolitan area. You're going to continue to hand out kits. Where, when, how and when do you get to this strong advocacy component so, and that, so that you can get out of the service delivery business? And if I were to supplement that by asking, what is the institutional follow-up of these, uh, given the presentation and the need, it's eminently reasonable to do that. The question is to sustain it for a longer period of time, and I cannot imagine the issue of homelessness being over in next few years. It, it's a long-term problem, so the question is how do we sustain it from year to year to year? All right, so we have a lot of components that we're going to talk about here. Uh, let's start off with talking about the organizational structure. We do plan on registering as a 501c3 organization, um, and it has been included in the budget to do that. Um, as far as sustainability, as we expand to other areas, we plan on partnering with other organizations. Um, as we have done in Athens, there are similar organizations in other areas, those coalitions that kind of oversee the organizations that serve the homeless, and so we'll be partnering with those as well. Um, 
Um, I'd like to add it. I'd like to add on to that. Um, we can't stress how important the education component is to our long-term goal. Um, with my experience, I am the only guy in this group. Some of the stories that were mentioned before were a little, I kind of cringe a little bit, and we're just trying to break that barrier. So in the long run, uh, people are more comfortable around this topic and around this issue and just increase awareness. And, I, I, okay, go ahead. I'm sorry, I'm going to speak directly to the advocacy portion of your question. Advocacy surrounding this topic is one of our most important components. When you think about donating to homeless, uh, to homeless organizations, you think food, you think soap, you think toothpaste, and people are willing to do this. In our community, we found that people donate on average five pounds of food. They're not, not donating these products because they don't want to. They're not donating them because they don't know it's an issue. And so one of the central tenets of FEM is that we will open this dialogue with the community members and we will say, this is an issue, you need to donate, you need to, you need to be aware of it. Um, and so that speaks also to the sustainability of our program. The more that we can open this dialogue, the more that people are aware that this is a problem, the more that they're going to be likely to donate and keep us going through the next couple of years. So, so just quickly follow up. So when you say you want to prevent this from becoming a problem, what you're saying it's the lack of access to the to the to okay. the products. That's what you really are aiming, so that there will always be an adequate supply for homeless women. Absolutely. So we know we can't end homelessness. Obviously, that's an issue that's way bigger than any of us here. Um, but what we what we can do is make sure that these women have the products that they need every single month. And right now, what we found in our community is that these shelters do try to offer them, but they have such a limited supply because of what Brianna said. People don't know it's an issue. They don't donate these products, and so they're often running out, almost always running out of these products. And so what we want to do through the advocacy portion is make people, like you guys in this room, aware so that you go home and tell someone else that it's an issue, and they go on and tell their friends. And one day, we have such a large group of people that now know they need to donate these products that there's no need for FEM anymore. That, that's our real dream is that this is not an issue but I would also say that it's not it, it's the issue is broader than just homeless women I think it's the, the underfed I think it's the the a lot of folks that are in poverty that come to food banks and have to make a decision between food and feminine hygiene products so I think the the issue is bigger than just the homeless I yeah that, that's absolutely true but the homeless population is one of the most marginalized population in our nation. And so we really wanted to focus on making sure that their needs are addressed because they do often go, and igno go ignored. Not everyone who is homeless has the ability to access a shelter. Not everyone has the ability to access a food bank. 50% of this population are living in these tent cities and they're not even approaching those organizations. And we wanted to make sure that we're going out directly to them and putting these kits in their hands. As part of this, I think, there's a, a sort of a myth that a lot of things that, that homeless people do is uh, about choice. And I think you can emphasize this is not a choice. This just is. That's a great point. I also wanted to compliment you for taking on a subject that might be uncomfortable to speak to. And Philip, you rock for being on this team. Congratulations, buddy. sign of a true public servant is giving voice to someone who does not have a voice, and, and you guys have done that today. I was not aware of this. I mean, I have a young daughter. When she goes to that Catholic girls' high school, this is one of the campaigns that I'm going to encourage her to do is student council. That's amazing. So, so already... Our contact information, have her reach out to us. We love that. Yeah. yeah, so we'll do this in Sacramento. But what I hope under your 501c3 happens is that you do use your Masters of Public Health and do some sort of... Um, documentation of the health benefits that have come from this. Yeah. So you have the service piece, but also what is your research, you know, publishing, are women, are homeless women healthy, are you preventing disease, are, you, know, you know, what are the outcomes for the population that you're serving, and did you have intent to do that? That's an incredibly good point. Um, when we first started to look into this, this problem, one of the things we found is there is no research on it, which is sad. And so one of the things that we'll be able to do as we get these products into the hands of women is we may be able to put in that research component mm -hmm. um, further down the line. And actually, as a part of the fundraising component of our proposal, 
Uh, one of the potential funders that's very interested in FEMA already, mm -hmm. they actually want to do research with us to try to start creating that foundation of, of metrics and analytics. So that is definitely something that we're considering. Yeah, and just to add on to that, we do have a number of, of outcome measures. So we'll be keeping track of how many kits we distribute directly to women, distribute to the organizations, and then how many they're distributing. But another important um, aspect of that is that we'll be conducting a baseline interview during our beta phase to find out what needs these women have now that aren't being met and then we'll continue to conduct those follow-up surveys throughout the remainder of implementation so that we can really track how those needs are changing over time and how FEM is having an impact on the needs of those homeless women and that's mental and physical I mean are you yeah well as you were showing on the I'm sorry go yeah ahead. Those, we'll address a number of those components and we'll also we mentioned do focus groups um, and that'll give more of a, an anecdotal uh, evidence base and we can really touch on on those physical and mental aspects and how that's really impacting their their personal lives so to come back to the earlier question that I raised about the future institutional framework so would you have uh, say county governments state local government provide these facilities to the homeless women how do you go about continuing this project because the homelessness is not going to go away. Mm -hmm. It's a long, long-term problem. Uh, and, and as far as the housing goes, we are not being able to solve over this many years. So question is, this is an almost a, a, a regular necessity for women. This is a health issue. So the question is, what is the long-term institutional structure Okay, so we have a, a, those few methods of distribution that we mentioned, and what we want to do is really create a, a hard plan that we can pass along to other communities so that they can implement it within their own community. FEM understands that we can't go to Ohio and implement this, right? There's, there's four of us here right now. We just don't have the ability to do that. But what we can do is pass them our exact plan so that they can very easily, and as you saw, very cheaply, implement it in their own community. And as I mentioned earlier, there are organizations serving the homeless all over the country. And the great thing about that is we, do, we know that we have people who are interested and are going to be willing to take on this mission, especially since we're going to make it so simple for them. Yeah, you should be seeking a very strong endorsement from the county and the state health departments. Mm -hmm. and they should be your partner in this, in this venture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we haven't taken that step yet, but that is a plan for the future, is to partner with those public health departments, health departments, different state government levels. Yeah, we do definitely have a plan to do that. We have about three minutes left. All right, well, since we have a few more minutes, I'm just going to tell you guys about a great resource that we have opening up in Athens. It's called the Athens Resource Center for the Homeless. We uh, refer to it as ARCH, and that's going to be a great partner that we're going to work with. They're opening in July of 2015. We've been in talks with Shea Post, who is director of the um, Athens Coalition for the Homeless, and she's very, very interested in helping us out. We're going to use that space as one of our distribution points, as well as storage and office space if we need that as well. And so we're very, very excited to be able to take advantage of that opportunity. And then I'd like to speak for a moment um, and tell you a story about a woman uh, who, was, who was experiencing homelessness. And she went to a homeless shelter, and the staff was asking her how she was doing and kind of about hygiene. And she started crying and started saying, I will never be clean. I will never be clean. I will never be clean. And that's the problem that we are trying to address. The fact that these women don't have access to basic necessities and that people don't know that they don't have access to basic necessities are the root of the problem that we're trying to address. And people, you, you may think that this is a, a small project, but it has such great consequence. It means so much to the women that we're going to be trying to help. Women, are, it, it, women experiencing homelessness need to be able to maintain basic standards of hygiene so that they can envision themselves as part of the mainstream society and, and kind of bring themselves out of poverty. Um, it's incredibly important for them. So. Thank you all so much for your time.